Sein Buch «Eine kurze Geschichte der Menschheit» wurde zum Megaseller. Mark Zuckerberg empfahl es zur Lektüre, Barack Obama und Bill Gates ebenso. Geschrieben hat erst der preisgekrönte Historiker Yuval Harari. Er lehrt an der Hebräischen Universität in Jerusalem und er ist heute zu Gast bei uns im Studio in Berlin. Das Buch «Eine kurze Geschichte der Menschheit» endete mit einem Cliffhanger. Der Homo sapiens hat 70'000 Jahre die Erde dominiert, doch die Erfolgsgeschichte könnte eines Tages zu Ende gehen. In seinem neuen Buch «Homo Deus» sagt Yuval Harari, wir stehen tatsächlich kurz vor dem Ende der Menschheit, wie wir sie kannten. Das müssen wir diskutieren. Herzlich willkommen, Yuval Harari. Hallo, es ist gut, hier zu sein. Ja, wie sieht es denn aus? Sind wir Menschen kurz vor dem Aussterben? Yes, but uh, not the end in the sense of a Hollywoodian film in which the robots go crazy and kill all the people. Uh, rather, it's far more likely that we will use new technologies, especially bioengineering and artificial intelligence, uh, to change ourselves, to upgrade ourselves into something which will be more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals or from chimpanzees. So I don't think there'll be humans like us on the planet in 200 years, but uh, our descendants, some kinds of cyborgs or whatever, they will dominate the future of life. Und was ist der Grund? Also warum haben wir Anlass, so etwas zu tun? Sie schreiben in Ihrem Buch ja sehr ausführlich darüber, dass es uns eigentlich wunderbar geht zurzeit. Wir sind nicht mehr bedroht von den üblichen Gefahren, die wir einmal hatten in unserem Leben. Es gibt keine oder nicht mehr viele ansteckende Krankheiten, die uns dahin raffen, wie Pest oder Pocken. Mhm. Es gibt nicht mehr so viel Welthunger, sondern wir sterben eher, weil wir zu viel essen, weil wir zu dick werden. Und es gibt auch nicht mehr so viele Kriege, auch wenn wir das fast nicht glauben können, wenn wir nach Syrien blicken. Mhm. Warum also sollen wir jetzt plötzlich finden, wir wollen was anderes werden als Menschen, wenn wir es doch so gut haben? Uh, because we want more power and we want greater happiness. And we think we'll achieve that by starting to change our bodies, our brains, even our minds. Throughout history, for thousands of years, humans have tried to gain power over the outside world, to change the world, to fit our desires, in order to, um, you know, basically, in order to satisfy ourselves. And it didn't work. We became far more powerful than ever before, but we did not become significantly happier. People today are thousands of times more powerful than in the Stone Age, but there is no indication that we are happier than people in the Stone Age. So now we turn our gaze inwards and we basically say it didn't work just changing the world outside. We need to start changing the world inside to change our bodies, to change our brains. I imagine that the main products of the 21st century economy will not be uh, vehicles and weapons and food. They will be bodies and brains. This is what we are starting to learn how to Uh, engineer and manufacture with biotechnology and with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in pursuit of greater power and greater happiness, we'll change ourselves and upgrade ourselves into something different. Und dieses andere, das wir anstreben, ist eben ein anderer Typus von Mensch zu werden. Sie sprechen von einem Homo Deus, währenddessen wir vorher Homo sapiens waren. Also wir beide sind ja, glaube ich, immer noch Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. Um diese Geschichte zu verstehen, und Sie sind ja Historiker, Sie zeichnen alles in einer großen Entwicklung nach, müssen wir vielleicht zuerst einen Schritt noch zurückstehen. Und Sie sagen, dass alles diese, diese Sehnsucht danach, das Glück in uns selber zu suchen, hat mit dem begonnen, was Sie Humanismus nennen. Was ist denn passiert in diesem Humanismus? What happened during humanism? Um, humanism is, is a quite late phenomenon of the last uh, two or three centuries, for most of history, people believed that authority came from outside and especially from above, from above the clouds, from the gods. In politics, in economics, in ethics, uh, it was the gods who told us what is good and what is bad and how we should behave. Then in the last two or three centuries, we saw the humanist revolution, which says, that authority doesn't come from outside, it comes from inside. 
the main source of authority is human beings and their feelings and free choices. In politics, if previously authority for the king or the emperor came from the gods, uh, he was king in the grace of God, humanism then came and said, no, authority should come from human feelings. So if we want to know who should be the next president of the United States, or whether uh, Britain should stay in the, in, the, in the European Union or not, we don't ask God, we don't ask the Queen, we don't ask the Archbishop of Canterbury, we go to each and every British citizen and we ask, what do you think? So authority comes from the feelings and choices of individuals. It's the same uh, in economics, when this, where the saying is, the customer is always right. The customer is the chief authority in economics. And it's also the same in ethics. Uh, previously, what was good and what was bad was determined by outside authorities. Again, like the Bible, like, like the Pope. So, for example, in the case of homosexuality, people said it's bad for two men uh, to have sex or to get married. Why? Because the Bible said so. Then came humanism and said, we don't care what the Bible says. We care about human feelings. If two men love each other and they don't harm anybody, so what could possibly be wrong with it? The highest authority is human feelings. Ich verstehe sehr gut, was Sie erzählen und gleichzeitig denke ich, stimmt das Bild wirklich, dass die Moderne sozusagen der Abschied von Gott bedeutet? Oder ist wirklich unsere Zeit eine Zeit, in der der Humanismus sich so sehr durchgesetzt hat, dass wir nicht mehr zu beten brauchen, um glücklich zu sein? Ist es nicht gerade so, dass die meisten mhm. Leute heute verzweifelter sind als früher? Sie sagen selber, es gibt nicht mehr so viele Kriegsopfer, sondern sehr viel mehr Menschen nehmen sich das Leben, sie bringen sich um. Es gibt mehr Opfer von Suiziden wie Kriegsopfer. Also die Menschen seien mhm. ja nicht glücklich, scheinen nicht glücklich zu sein. Yeah, I mean, uh, humans are not happier than before, even though their condition is much better than before, uh, due to two main reasons. First of all, human happiness depends on expectations, not on objective condition. If you get what you want, you're happy. If you want something, no matter what, and you don't get it, you're dissatisfied. And the problem is, that as conditions improve, expectations increase. So we today enjoy many things that throughout history people dreamt about, but we don't feel satisfied because we want much more. Uh, and on an even deeper level, the basic reaction of the human mind to achievement and to pleasure is not satisfaction, it's craving for more. So no matter what we achieve, we just crave for more. Ist eigentlich aber auch der Motor des Kapitalismus. Wir müssen doch mehr wollen, um das System mm -hmm. am Leben zu erhalten. Yes, certainly. Um, if people were satisfied with what they have, capitalism will, will, would have collapsed. Um, so it's based on that, but it's obviously much older than capitalism. It's not just a modern phenomenon. It was the same thing, I mean, also, I don't know, in the Middle Ages. So if you became a king, and you had your kingdom, you're very rarely satisfied with your kingdom. You wanted to conquer some more. And if you managed to conquer the neighboring kingdom, still you weren't satisfied. You wanted another and another. And this is how you build an empire. So this tendency of the mind to react to achievement with craving, not with satisfaction, it's not a modern phenomenon. It's part of human nature, really. And Capitalism builds on that, but it's not the cause of this uh, tendency. Jetzt, wenn wir bei diesem Punkt bleiben, dass äh, Gott sozusagen abgeschafft werden kann, am Ende des Humanismus, am Punkt, an dem wir jetzt stehen, dann kann man sagen, die, äh, die Empirie weist aber in eine andere Richtung. Ich habe eine, eine Grafik mitgenommen vom Pew Research Center, die mhm. mich selber auch erstaunt hat. Wir sehen die Zahlen von 2010. 16,4 Prozent sind konfessionsfreie Menschen. 2050 hochgerechnet rechnen sie nur noch mit 13,2 Prozent. Das heißt, sogar weniger Menschen werden sozusagen gottlos sein im Jahr 2050. Die Muslime nehmen zu. Das heißt, das widerspricht doch eigentlich dieser These, die Sie vertreten, dass Gott 
sozusagen auf der Müllhalde yeah. der Ideen no, no, landet. People, people still believe in God, he is just far less important. I'm not saying that God has disappeared. I mean, I come from Israel, I come from the Middle East, I know perfectly well that most people still, certainly in the Middle East, still believe in God, but he is just far less important than in any previous time in history. Um, people believe in it, in him, because their feelings tell them to believe in him. I mean, even in, in religion, you see that feelings, human feelings, are the main source of authority. For example, I don't know, when there is a gay pride parade in Jerusalem, every year for the last 10 years, there is a gay pride parade in Jerusalem. And uh, it's a rare day of harmony in Jerusalem, which is usually full of conflict and hatreds. So one day a year, the gay parade, there is harmony because all the religious Jews and Muslims and Christians, they all come together and shout and, and, and uh, 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 object to the gay parade. So they have a common cause. But the argument they are using, they don't say you shouldn't have a gay parade because God says it's a sin. They say it hurts our feelings. You shouldn't have a gay parade because when you have a gay parade in the holy city of Jerusalem, it hurts our feelings. So even they have learned to speak in the language of human feelings, not of divine commandments. And even more importantly, if you look at the history, say of the last hundred years, and you ask yourself, uh, what were the most important inventions or discoveries or, or new ideas of the 20th century? So it's very difficult to say what was the most important. You have so many candidates. That's internet. Uh, you have, you have uh, the internet, you have computers, the nuclear war uh, weapons, you have antibiotics, uh, the, you have uh, so many things. Oh, many but, many uses. but then, yes, but then you ask yourself, what was the most important discovery or invention or new idea of the traditional religions? And there is nothing. Hmm. What did rabbis and priests and, and mullahs think about, which you can mention in the same breath as antibiotics or feminism or computers? I mean, religion is still there, traditional religion, but it has been transformed from a creative force into a reactive force. In the Middle Ages, religions were extremely innovative. Uh, the Christian church was the closest thing to Silicon Valley that medieval Europe had. It was the most, it founded many of the universities, it pioneered uh, data processing, all kinds of systems to collect and analyze and archive data. The church was leading that. So any king who wanted to establish a bureaucracy, an administration, he would turn to the priests and the monks. But today, the church and most other uh, religious, religious institutions, they are just a reactive force. They don't pioneer anything. Somebody invents the internet mm. and then all the rabbis discuss, what should we do with it? Should we allow religious Jews to serve the internet or not? You have the, like, the new ideas of feminism and all the priests go, oh, what do we do with that? How do we <laughs> confront this incendiary idea? Hier spricht ja der brillante Historiker aus Ihnen, der eben diesen großen Bogen zeichnet. Und für mich ist es auch so, wenn ich dieses Buch lese, dass ich die ganze Zeit denke, ich möchte über alle diese Thesen mit Ihnen gleich sprechen. Und ich finde das alles hochinteressant. Ich habe mich nur gefragt, ist es nicht trotzdem eine These, die stark auf die westlich gedachte Welt zutrifft, die eben diese Sehnsucht hat, den Menschen weiterzuentwickeln, weil sie nämlich nicht mehr auf Gott gesetzt hat und Gott jetzt sozusagen in der eigenen Überhöhung sucht, das ist so ungefähr mhm. eine der Kernthesen, währenddessen ich den Eindruck habe, eben, schauen wir in den Nahen Osten, gibt es da nicht die andere Bewegung, dass man sagt, nein, nein, wir wollen eben genau die Politik wieder mit der Religion zusammenbringen. Wir wollen eben genau, dass die Religion wieder die Macht hat. Yes, but I mean, it's like in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. It's not that the entire world suddenly uh, began to believe in the power of industry, in the steam engine, in electricity, in the telegraph. Very few countries led the way in the industrialization of the world. Countries like first Britain, and then France and Germany, the United States, most countries did not industrialize. They remained far behind. 
but the few countries that industrialized, they gained control of the entire world, and they shaped the world, the, the world as we know it. They shaped not just Britain, they shaped Africa and Asia and the Middle East and South America. Uh, countries or cultures that in the 21st century stay behind, they don't join the new revolutions of biotechnology and artificial intelligence and so forth, they will again fall victim to the new superpowers. It would not necessarily be the European countries again. Maybe it will be China and South Korea. But the few countries that will lead the new revolutions of biotechnology and artificial intelligence, they will gain even greater power than Britain and France had in the 19th century. They will shape all the world of the 21st century. Und dann, und dann würden Sie sagen, das ist dann wie eine Ansteckung. Die anderen werden mitziehen, ob sie wollen oder nicht. Uh, not necessarily dragged, but maybe occupied and exploited, like happened to India and China and most of Africa in the 19th century. Uh, basically, now I think it's the most important question facing every country in the world is whether it leads this revolution or it remains behind. And if it remains behind, it is in greater danger than what happened to, again, Africa or China in the 19th century, when they did not join the Industrial Revolution on time, and therefore they were conquered and exploited by the few industrial powers, mm -hmm. like Britain and France and later Japan and the United States. Bleiben wir mal bei der Welt, die jetzt eben, oder bei, sagen wir, der Kultur vielleicht auch, die diese Revolution vorantreibt. Also nehmen wir mal an, Sie haben recht, die Menschen möchten keine Homo sapiens mehr sein, sondern Homo Deus werden. Dann haben Sie am Anfang schon gesagt, es gibt verschiedene Möglichkeiten, wie dieses Upgrade vorangetrieben werden kann. Sie bieten eigentlich drei Möglichkeiten an. Sie sagen, das könnte genetische Selektion sein oder genetische Verbesserung. Dann wären wir vielleicht in 200 Jahren so etwas wie Designer-Babys, die erwachsen geworden sind. Mhm. Das könnte so etwas sein wie Cyborgs. Das heißt, wir beginnen uns technisch zu verbessern und werden halb zu Maschinen. Mhm. Oder es könnte so etwas sein wie Artificial Intelligence, also künstliche Intelligenzen, Androide, Roboter, die eigentlich menschenähnliche Qualitäten haben, aber intelligenzmäßig uns noch weit äh, überlegen sind. Mhm. Drei Typen, wie man Homo Deus werden kann. Welchen Typus würden Sie wählen, wenn Sie wählen könnten? Mm. Personally, I think that... Um Maybe it's not the best aims for human life to want to become a superhuman and to have all these uh, immense powers. Um, it's not, again, it's not an agenda, which is my personal agenda. And it's not something that I'm saying to people, you should do, do it. I'm just saying as a historian, this is happening. You can see it all around us. I mean, if we talk about humans merging with computers, to form cyborgs. Cyborgs are entities which are part human, part computer or part robot. It's not a vision for the future. It's a process that is already beginning to happen. People in 2017 are merging with their smartphones, with their Facebook accounts, with their uh, computers, more and more tasks that we previously relied on our brain or on our body we outsource to these devices, and we are very close to the point when we connect these devices directly to our body. So it's not like I have a smartphone, but the smartphone is part of me. Uh, the next wave of revolution in, in this respect uh, has to do with biometric sensors, which will be part of our bodies and which will constantly transmit biometric data from inside our body to a smartphone or a computer and receive commands in return. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I can give you a few examples of what this means in the term of the you know, daily life of individuals, uh, how it changes. I mean, uh, if you think about all these dating services online, so think that you have a biometric sensor on your body, that you walk down the street and you see somebody and you like that person. And your smartphone or the application on the smartphone 
immediately knows you find this person sexually attractive because your blood pressure is increasing, because your eyes are opening a bit wider, and so forth. And you don't even know it yourself, maybe, but the application knows it. And it can contact the smartphone of the other person and see whether the other person also finds you attractive. It doesn't have to go through your brain and through your eyes and through your free will. Mm -hmm. uh, the smartphone takes over from you and increasingly manages your sexual life or your romantic life. Und Sie sagen jetzt selber, es geht jetzt gar nicht mehr erstmal darum äh, zu bewerten, was wir äh, da aussuchen möchten. Das werden wir später noch machen. Sondern Sie beschreiben erst einmal und sagen, als Historiker interessiert sich die Bewegung. Sie interessiert die Evolution des Menschen und Sie sagen, da passiert etwas ganz, ganz Grundlegendes im Moment. Mhm. Das finde ich schon an sich interessant, dass Sie als Historiker in die Zukunft schauen. Mhm. Was macht eigentlich ein Historiker, wenn er in die Zukunft blickt? Well, I try to, I don't try to predict the future because this is impossible. Nobody knows what will happen in 20 or 50 years. Rather, I try to map different possibilities. And I'm mainly interested not in the technology as such, but rather in the social and political and philosophical implications of the technology. Uh, I am not a specialist in computer science or biology. So I'm not interested and I don't have the understanding of the technical aspects of machine learning or genetic engineering. But based on what I know of previous revolutions in history, I try to uh, map the different possibilities. What will artificial intelligence do to the job market, to family structure, to romantic relationships, to religion? These are the questions that as a historian I bring to the study of the future. Und wenn Sie beschreiben, was mit uns Menschen passieren wird, eben an dieser Schnittstelle zum Homo Deus hin, dann haben Sie jetzt gerade zum Beispiel beschrieben, wie sehr wir verschmelzen könnten mit den Maschinen. Und ein Stück weit sagen Sie da aber auch im Buch, es wird so weit kommen, dass der Mensch sich als Mensch abschafft. Und das hat auch damit zu tun, dass Sie sagen, der Mensch ist überhaupt nicht so speziell, wie wir immer gemeint haben. Der Mensch ist eigentlich, wenn wir genau hinschauen, mhm. nur ein Algorithmus. Das müssen Sie erklären. Mhm. Oh, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, basically, the idea is that um, humans have no free will. That free will is a kind of mythology we've inherited from Christianity and from previous traditions and, and religions. And that human feelings are really based on extremely fast calculations. That the nervous system and the brain, I mean, this is currently the orthodoxy in the life sciences, that sensations and feelings and emotions are the result of extremely fast calculations or algorithms that are themselves the result or were shaped by natural selection. So again, I give an example because this sounds very abstract. What does it mean that emotions and sensations are algorithms or calculations? So let's look at even not even humans, but other animals, baboons. Baboons also have emotions. They also have sensations. So let's say you're in a baboon in the African savanna, and you see a tree with bananas on it. But not from, so far from the tree, you also see a lion. And you need to make a decision. Do I risk my life for the bananas or not? This is the kind of decision that animals had to make for millions and millions of years of evolution in order to survive. Now, This is actually a problem of calculating probabilities. What is the probability that if I try to get the bananas, the lion will eat me, versus the probability that if I give up these bananas, I will starve to death? <laughs> In order to survive, the baboon has to calculate the probabilities. For that, the baboon needs a lot of information. Information about the bananas. How far are they? How many bananas? Are they big or small, uh, ripe or green? Three small green bananas is a very different issue than 10 big juicy bananas. The baboon also needs information about the lion. How far is the lion? 
how fast the lion can run. Is the lion asleep or awake? The baboon also needs information about himself, how fast I can run, how hungry I am, and so forth. Now, the baboon needs to take all this data and calculate it in a split second. How does the baboon do it? Not with pen and paper or calculator, the entire body of the baboon, and especially what we call sensations and emotions, they are the calculator. The data comes in through sensations, mm -hmm. through smell and touch and sight, and within a split second, the brain calculates the probabilities and they, the answer will appear as an emotion, either the emotion of courage or the emotion of fear. What we call emotions are actually algorithms calculating probabilities. And this is true not just of baboons and not just of lions, but also of humans. Genau, und, und da wird's ja interessant oder da tut's auch weh. Weil wenn wir uns so vorstellen, dann gehen sie weiter und sagen, okay, und jetzt gibt es Algorithmen da draußen, irgendwelche Computerprogramme, Sensoren, biometrische Sensoren haben sie schon genannt, oder mit der Zeit kleinste Nanocomputer, die durch unsere Blutbahnen flitzen und Messungen vornehmen. Und dann werden die Algorithmen uns sagen, wie wir entscheiden sollen, weil die nämlich zusammen mit unserem ganzen evolutionären Programm kurz geschlossen sehr viel treffsicherer wissen, was für uns eigentlich gut ist. Wir werden yes, uns daran I mean, gewöhnen. The, the idea is that if up till now your biochemical algorithms, your feelings, were the best algorithms in the universe, they were shaped by millions of years of evolution, and it was a good idea to trust your feelings, now we are on the verge of creating electronic algorithms that know us better than we know ourselves and can give us better advice on how to behave and how to make decisions. It starts with very simple things, like for example, uh, which book to read. So previously, uh, in the humanist age, how did you choose which book to read? You relied on your feelings and emotions and on the recommendation of a few friends and family members. But now you go online to the Amazon virtual bookshop and immediately an algorithm pops up and tells you, I know you, I've been following you, I've been collecting data on you, and based on that and on statistics, on millions of other readers, I recommend to you this or that book. You know. but, but this is still very primitive because the next yeah. stage, which is already happening, is that you start collecting more data on the person. If you read a book on Kindle, then as you read the book, the book is reading you. For the first time in history, books are reading people. Genau, und genau deswegen will ich keinen Kindle und genau deswegen will ich keine Bücher bei Amazon bestellen, weil ich nämlich das lesen will, was ich lesen will. Und Sie sagen jetzt, liebe Frau Bleisch, vergessen Sie es, es gibt kein Ich. But what do you mean the books that, are, how do you know which books are really going to be good for you in terms, whatever, whatever measurement you decide, you want pleasure, you want intellectual enrichment, whatever you want, how do you know which books are good for you? At present you rely on your, you know, your instincts. Genau, aber es fühlt sich so an, als wäre es meine Entscheidung und zu meinen Entscheidungen gehört auch, dass ich mich täusche, dass ich auf die Nase falle, dass ich scheitere, aber das bin ich. Yes, but what if you can get better books that <laughs> enrich your life more? That after you read the book, you say, yes, this was a good book. I, I, I thank Amazon for recommending this book to me. I would never have thought of reading it myself, but thanks to Amazon, now I'm reading this book. If you Lesen really... Sie nur solche Bücher? <laughs> I think more and more. Uh, I think that this is, again, happening all around us, like... Something that already happened is how people navigate in space. Previously, you want to get from here to the central train station, you trust your instincts and your own feelings. At present, more and more people trust Google Maps. They reach an intersection and their gut feeling is turn right, but Google tells them, no, 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 there is a traffic jam on the right, turn left. And more and more people learn by experience to trust Google 
more than their own feelings because the algorithm is better. If this happens not just with books, think about far more important things like how to choose friends or how even to choose a husband or a wife. I think that in the not too distant future, given enough data and enough, bi enough computing power, people will trust Google or Amazon or Facebook or whatever to choose even their friends and their husband or wife. Mm -hmm. Sie haben ein Problem bis jetzt umschifft, oder wir haben es gemeinsam umschifft, nämlich das, was die Philosophen das Hard Problem nennen, das Problem des Bewusstseins. Weil wenn wir den Menschen einfach als Algorithmus ähm, beschreiben, der eben verbessert werden kann mit zusätzlichen externen Algorithmen, dann stellt sich die Frage, wo genau ist eigentlich das, was wir früher Seele nannten, heute Bewusstsein nennen, wo hat das Platz? Und gibt hm. es da nicht doch einen Unterschied zwischen uns als Menschen, uns Tieren, vielleicht gewissen Tieren und vor allem eben irgendwelcher künstlicher Intelligenz. Well, we need to distinguish between soul and consciousness. Soul is a mythological concept. We have absolutely no evidence for the existence of soul. If by soul you mean some individual eternal essence that remains unchanged from birth to death, and maybe even beyond death, continues to exist forever. In, in, he, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in this sense, we have absolutely no evidence that anything like that really exists. It's just mythology. Consciousness, on the other hand, is a stream of subjective experiences that we uh, experience every moment. It's the most real thing in the world. The entire world may be some kind of dream or a matrix, like in, the, like in the movie The Matrix, but my consciousness is real. It's the one thing in the world I cannot doubt. If I feel pain, I don't know maybe what is the source of the pain, but the actual feeling of pain, this is reality. And uh, at present, we don't have any good theory of what consciousness is or how it emerges. Scientists assume that the brain somehow produces conscious experiences, but we don't have any idea how it actually happens. Das ist ein Stück weit, wenn ich Sie richtig verstehe, die Position von Daniel Dennett, dem großen Philosophen, ein Stück weit auch eine sehr physikalistische Position, dass man sagt, mm -hmm. auch Bewusstsein ist zurückführbar auf Algorithmen, auf physikalische Prozesse, biochemische Prozesse, die uns, in uns ablaufen. Aber es ist eben nichts Mystisches an diesem Bewusstsein. Well, this is the common uh, theory today in the life sciences, that somehow biochemical and electrical processes in the brain create conscious experiences. When billions of neurons in the brain are firing in a particular pattern, you experience love. When they fire in a different pattern, you experience hate. This is the common theory, but as of 2017, we have absolutely no idea how or why it happens. Why is it mm -hmm. that when billions of neurons are, are firing, how does this create the, uh, the subjective experience of love, we just don't know. I think the best thing about science, in contrast to religion, is that if you don't know something, you don't have to invent some fanciful theory. You can just come and say, we don't know. Und deswegen spricht man in der Philosophie ja auch vom hard problem, weil wir es nicht wissen und bis jetzt yes. nicht wirklich gelöst haben. Und sagen Sie, lange haben wir an Gott geglaubt, unsere Religion bestand darin, zum Beispiel an eine Seele zu glauben, auch daran zu glauben, dass der Mensch die Krone der Schöpfung sei, was ganz Spezielles, was kein Roboter je sein wird, was kein Tier je war. Und mhm. jetzt kommt eine neue Religion mit dem Homo Deus, der Homo Deus, der glaubt an den Dataismus. Was genau ist das für eine Religion? Well, Dataism is the idea that given enough data and enough computing power, an external algorithm can understand me better than I understand myself and therefore will have the authority to make decisions about my life. Religion in the end is about authority. Religion is not about God, it's not about heaven, it's not about sin. For thousands of years, 
the main religious story was that authority comes from God. And you had this or that mythology. In the last two, three centuries, we had the humanist revolution and the new story said, no, authority comes from human feelings. Now we have the next revolution, the Dataist revolution, which says authority doesn't come from God and it doesn't come from humans. Authority comes from data. Und jetzt haben wir noch gar nicht darüber gesprochen, was dazu auch noch gehört, nämlich der Umgang mit dem Tod. Sie sagen, der Tod wird in Zukunft mit dieser dataistischen Revolution, mit der Revolution zum Homo Deus hin ein technisches Problem werden. Und das ist ja auch etwas, was viele mhm. Futuristen sagen. Ray Kurzweil ist ein berühmtes Beispiel dafür. Zusammen mit einem Google-Subunternehmen sind sie daran, den Tod abzuschaffen. Sie sagen, bereits 2050 werden wir regelmäßig hingehen, einen biologischen Reset-Button drücken können, uns general überholen lassen und dann können wir locker 400 Jahre alt werden. Mhm. Glauben Sie das wirklich? I think it's premature that by 2050 we won't have the necessary technology to extend life indefinitely. But I think that given a century or two, it's quite likely. Uh, but already today, actually already in the last century or two, death has been reconceptualized as a technical problem. For most of history, death was seen as a metaphysical phenomenon, and most religions sanctified death. They saw it as an essential part of life and really as the source of the meaning of life. If you think about ancient Egypt with the pyramids and the mummies, or if you think about Christianity and Islam, they have no meaning without death. Without an afterlife, without heaven and hell and so forth, there is no Christianity. So death is essential. But over the last two, three centuries, new secular ideologies emerged, which no longer draw the meaning of life from death. They see death as just an unfortunate technical problem. If you think about communism and socialism and feminism and liberalism and all these other new ideologies, they don't draw the meaning of life from death. What happens to a communist after he dies? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just not a question that Marx even cared about what happened to you after you die. And it's the same with feminism. What happens to a feminist after he or she dies? It's not something that you ask in feminism. Death has already been taken out of the equation. People don't die because this is part of the divine plan. People die because they have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And why do they have a heart attack? Because of some other technical problem. And Aber die, die Sinnstiftung des Todes, die kann ja auf zwei Arten geschehen, philosophisch gesehen. Man kann sagen, einerseits, es gibt diese Idee, dass wir weiterleben nach dem Tod und der Sinn besteht darin, der Sinn des Todes besteht darin, dass es nachher weitergeht. Es gibt aber auch diejenigen, die sagen, der, Sinn hat, der Tod hat einen Sinn für unser jetziges Dasein, weil nur dadurch, dass wir endlich sind, wird es nicht langweilig auf Erden. Weil sonst sind wir gefangen in der ewigen Wiederholung. Und genau diesen Punkt widerspricht Ray Kurzweil. Und ich möchte das mit Ihnen ganz kurz anschauen, was er dazu sagt. Wenn wir radikale Lebensverlängerung ohne radikale Lebenserweiterung hätten, würde es langweilig werden. Aber es wird beides geschehen. Wir werden unsere Persönlichkeit erweitern, wir werden Computer in unserem Körper haben und so unser Wissen und unsere Fähigkeiten erweitern. Wir werden Millionen virtueller Umgebungen direkt erfahren können. Wir werden unsere emotionalen Fähigkeiten vergrößern. Wir werden kreativer werden. Alles Dinge, die das Leben lebenswert machen. Well, I think that uh, there are also many problems that will happen once we can extend life uh, almost indef indefinitely. First of all, it's probably going to be very expensive, at least in the first few generations. So only the rich will have this chance to live on beautiful and young uh, for hundreds of years. And this will create immense anger among the rest of the population, among the poor. Because throughout history, death was the great equalizer. The poor always told themselves, okay, the rich people, they have it good now, but they are going to die just like us. 
But think about a world in which only the poor people die and the rich don't die. This will create a lot of anger. And also, even if you're rich, uh, you'll be far more anxious than ever before. Because what we are talking about is not immortality in the sense of not being able to die. You can still die. You can live indefinitely thanks to all the new treatments. But if something happens, like a truck runs you over, you're dead and there is nothing to do about it. So the level of anxiety from death will be much higher than ever before. People will not be willing to take any risks because, you know, today I, I come here, it's risky, the, the plane may crash or whatever, but I'm going to die anyway. So I'm willing to take some risks in life. But to miss the opportunity to live forever uh, because I made this or that mistake, uh, the levels not only of anger, but also of anxiety may be much higher than ever before. Das ist ein Punkt, den man negativ sehen könnte. Das andere ist, dass mir ehrlich gesagt dieser grenzenlose Optimismus irgendwie übertrieben scheint. Obwohl ich auch immer wieder denke, Sie bringen so viele Beispiele im Buch, dass man sich schon äh, hinterfragen muss in den Überzeugungen, die man hat. Ich hatte zum Beispiel die starke Überzeugung, dass künstliche Wesen, Roboter, nie wirklich kreativ werden können oder nicht so kreativ wie wir. Mhm. Ich habe ein Musikstück mitgebracht. Kennen Sie diese Musik? Oh, ja, ja, ja. <laughs> Was ist es? Um, I, I'm not, I don't know this particular track, but I give in the book the example genau. of uh, a, a computer program that composes music in the style of Johann Sebastian Bach. And most people are, un, including me, are Auch unable <laughs> to tell the difference what is Bach and what was composed by the computer. Und das Computerprogramm kann, so schreiben Sie es, 5000 Choräle in einem Tag komponieren. Yes, and you know, if you think about art, well, I mean, it's, again, it's a philosophical question. What is the main purpose of art? Some people believe that the main purpose is to inspire human emotions. But if art is about inspiring human emotions, then very soon computers would be much better artists than human beings because, again, given their data and their computing power, they will be able to play on human emotions much better than any human artist. They won't have emotions of their own. Computers have no consciousness, they have no feelings, they have no emotions, but they will have the ability to manipulate or inspire human emotions much more accurately than any human artist. Wenn ich in ein Konzert gehe, dann möchte ich aber nicht nur den perfekten Klang, sondern ich schätze es, die Musiker zu sehen, von denen ich weiß, die sind wie ich aus Fleisch und Blut und die haben diese, dieses perfekte Können. Die sind in der Lage, so zu spielen, wie ich es nie beherrschen werde. Und das zu erleben, berührt mich ja auch. Es ist ja nicht alleine der perfekte Klang. Und eine Maschine würde ich nie gleichermaßen bewundern. Oder glauben Sie, das wird sich auch ändern? No, I think it will change. Uh, it's a question, it's a generation, it's a question really of expectations. Uh, you're brought up on particular expectations from art and uh, maybe you're horrified by something that breaks your expectation. But if you hear music from, say, behind a screen and this music touches you, and inspires you, and you feel love and fear and anger and whatever, and then the screen is pulled away and you see there are no humans there, it's just a computer, what would you think? I mean, your emotions were still real. I mean, you can say, you can change your definition of art and say, no, art is not about inspiring human emotions. It's about something else. And then maybe it won't work. But as long as people believe that art is about inspiring human emotions, I think very soon computers will be better artists than most human beings. Mhm. Herr Harari, Ihr Buch liest sich spannend wie ein Krimi. Und natürlich habe ich mir die ganze Zeit die Frage gestellt, und damit komme ich eigentlich zurück zum Anfang unseres Gesprächs, zur Bewertung, nämlich ich habe mich die ganze Zeit gefragt, finden Sie eigentlich die Geschichte, die Sie erzählen, selber attraktiv? 
Ich meine, möchten Sie gerne in dieser Welt leben? Well, then, I, I said my job as a historian is not to say this is good, this is bad, uh, to be optimistic or pessimistic, but first of all just to try to see what is happening in the world around us and what is likely to happen in the coming decades, in the coming generations. Uh, this is the first and most important task. Of course, it should be emphasized that technology is not deterministic. We can use the same technology to build very different kinds of societies. In the 20th century, uh, we had new technologies like trains and radio and television and electricity. And we could use these technologies to build communist dictatorships or fascist regimes or liberal democracies. They, they all had television. But uh, it's, and, and it was really up to human beings to decide what to do with them. It's the same in the 21st century. We are going to have these new technologies, artificial intelligence and bioengineering and so forth, but they don't determine a single future. They open different possibilities and it's up to us to try and make wise decisions what to do with them. Absolut. Zukunft lässt sich gestalten. Zukunft ist nicht einfach etwas, was wir beschreiben, sondern wir müssen uns damit auseinandersetzen und es gestalten. Und denn genau deswegen frage ich Sie noch einmal, Sie, die Sie so viel wissen über die Zukunft, wie finden Sie denn, dass wir die Zukunft gestalten sollten? Well, I would say that the most important question is the question of suffering. Uh, we should try as much as possible to understand what suffering is and what is the deep source of suffering and how to reduce the suffering in the world. And every technology can be used in ways that increase or decrease suffering. Uh, to give an example, not even from humans, but from other animals. If you think about how we treat other animals, and especially farm animals, like cows and pigs and chickens, they are probably the most miserable animals on the world, in the world. Uh, the amount of suffering that the meat industry and dairy industry is causing to billions of animals is really um, unimaginable. Now, biotechnology can either increase or decrease this suffering. You can use biotechnology to engineer cows and pigs and chickens that produce more meat more efficiently while completely disregarding what it means in terms of the experience of the animal itself. But you can also use biotechnology to create what is known as um, clean meat or cellular meat, meat grown Künstliche from cells. Fleisch, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If, if you want a steak, you don't need to raise a cow, kill the cow and have a steak. You can just mm -hmm. grow a steak from cells. It is actually being done uh, four years ago The cost of a clean steak was $300,000. Today, it's down to $11. With proper investment and research, within 10 years, we can start selling mm -hmm. uh, these cellular steaks and hamburgers cheaper than slaughtered meat. And this is a choice we can make. Und es ist nicht nur die Wahl, die wir haben, sondern ich glaube, da spricht ja jetzt auch nicht nur der Historiker aus Ihnen, sondern Sie leben ja selber auch als Veganer. Sie danken in diesem Buch auch mhm. Ihren drei Hunden für die Hundeperspektive, die Sie diesem Buch ein Stück weit <lacht> gegeben haben. Sie lachen, weil es äh, ist natürlich vielleicht ein bisschen ironisch gemeint, aber trotzdem mhm. interessiert es mich. Was ist eine Hundeperspektive oder was tragen die Hunde bei dazu, wie Sie auf die Welt blicken? Well, it's the reminder that human beings are not the only entities that have feelings and emotions and sensations. They are not the only entities that can suffer or be happy. And when we think about the future, we need to take into account the impact of our actions on the suffering or happiness of other animals and not just human beings. Sie sind auch ein Mensch, der sehr viel meditiert. Und wenn ich Sie so höre über das Mitgefühl sprechen, frage ich mich, hat das vielleicht auch einen Zusammenhang? 
Sie meditieren täglich zwei Stunden wie Passana-Meditation. Mhm. Sie gehen auch 30 bis 60 Tage pro Jahr in die Berge für sich, ganz in die Ruhe, ohne irgendwelche Computer. <lacht> Das ist ja eigentlich berühmt an dieser Art von Meditation, dass es da auch darum geht, nicht nur zur Ruhe zu kommen und sich zu beobachten, den Atem zu beobachten, sondern auch Mitgefühl zu erlernen. Hm. Ist das etwas, was Sie spezifisch aus dieser Meditation ziehen? Yes, very much. It's something I gained from, uh, from the meditation I practice, as you say, Vipassana meditation. And... Um For me, maybe the most important question of all is what is reality? What is real? Our minds are constantly generating stories and fictions and fantasies that don't allow us to see reality. And uh, meditation, for me, is not an escape from reality, but it's a method to get in touch with reality, to somehow see through all the fantasies and all the fictional stories that our minds constantly construct. I mean, it begins with very simple realities. When I began meditating uh, 17 years ago, I was doing my PhD at Oxford, and I went to try this Vipassana meditation. And the first exercise was very simple. Just observe the breath coming in and out of your nostrils. Just, that's it. Don't control it, just see when it comes in, when it goes out. And I, you know, I was doing my PhD, I thought I was a very smart person, I know my mind, I have control over my attention. I couldn't do it for more than 10 seconds. I would try to focus on the breath and immediately the mind would run away to some memory, some story, some fantasy. And I realized I know nothing about my mind and I have no control over my attention. And how can you hope to observe far deeper realities about yourself, like the deep source of your suffering? And how can you hope to understand the world if you cannot observe the simple reality of breath coming in and out of your nostrils? So this is where I, I began my practice of meditation. And over these 17 years, uh, it gave me the focus and the clarity to understand myself and the world a little better, and in particular, to understand the deep source of suffering in my life and in the world as a whole. Wenn wir noch einmal zurückgehen zu diesem Zeitalter des Homo Deus, in dem der Mensch äh, ein Upgrade äh, anfängt, und ich Ihre These nehme von vorhin, dass Sie gesagt haben, wichtig wäre Ihnen, dass wir den Wert des Mitgefühls äh, kultivieren, können wir denn hoffen, dass diese neuen Menschen Mitgefühl haben werden? Können wir hoffen, dass auch irgendwelche Roboter, Cyborgs, Androide Mitgefühl haben werden? Not necessarily. It depends on how we change ourselves, how we design all these new technologies and products and so forth. Uh, one of the dangers is that uh, they will be designed according to the needs of the economic system, of the military system, of the political system, and we will have far more efficient uh, humans, but they will not necessarily be more empathic or more ethical or happier than we are. Eine ganz kurze Frage zum Schluss, Yuval Harari. Karl Valentin hat mal gesagt, früher war die Zukunft auch besser. Stimmen Sie ihm zu? Um, No, I think that in every generation, people have extreme expectations about the future, but they are also very frightened about the future. Um, in this sense, we are not different from previous generations. I think where we are different is that today, it's more difficult than in any previous time in history uh, to envision what kind of world will there be in 20 or 30 years. In the past, humans could always envision, at least in basic form, the world of 30 years from now. Uh, let's say you live in the Middle Ages, so you don't know, maybe the Mongols will invade next year, maybe there will be an epidemic, but you have a pretty good idea what people will look like and what people will do for a living in 30 years. Today, we have no idea 
what the job market would look like in 30 years, or even what the human body would be like in 30 or 50 years, uh, which has a lot of practical implications. It's not just a philosophical discussion. For example, we have no idea what to teach children at school today because we just don't know what kind of world they would live in in 30 years. Und ich habe von Ihnen einmal mehr gelernt, dass Zukunft Herkunft braucht und dass es sich lohnt, die Geschichte zu studieren, um Visionen zu entwickeln, wie es weitergehen soll. Ich danke Ihnen sehr für dieses Gespräch. Dankeschön. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Am Ostersonntag spinnt mein Kollege Yves Bossart den Faden der Zukunft weiter. Er trifft den Schweizer Schriftsteller Jonas Lüscher und fragt ihn, ob uns der Fortschritt auch voranbringt oder ob die Optimisten im Silicon Valley naive Träumer sind. Und jetzt gleich sehen Sie ein Porträt über einen, der so markige Sätze schrieb wie «Die ersten Menschen waren nicht die letzten Affen». Erich Kästner war aber nicht nur für viele Bonmos gut, sondern ein brillanter Beobachter seiner Zeit. Bleiben Sie dran, genießen Sie den Sonntag, bis bald. <lacht>